Oh, yes, Lord, in the name of Jesus. <sighs> Praise God, amen. amen. Praise God, amen. amen. Wonderful. Uh, let's take our sets in the presence of the Lord. I'm going to be ministering to us today uh, from... Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. That's going to be our main reading. Amen. Uh, I, I think I might actually begin on a series where I'll be talking about how to pass from curse to blessing. Amen. You see, it is the will of God in order for us to live a life of blessing. It is the will of God for us to lead a life of blessing. So if we have opened our Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 to 14, the Bible reads and it says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Amen. You see, um, okay, I, I, want, I, want, I want us to say this. Um, I want us to say that Christ became a case, and I need you to use your hands, your left hand, Christ became a curse, that you might become a, that you might receive a blessing. Christ became a curse, that I may receive the blessing. Christ became a curse, that I may receive the blessing. Amen. It is the will of God for you to lead a blessed life. But, you know, as we, as we observe and look through life, we realize one thing. We realize that there are, like, for instance, when you, when you look into the scriptures, you realize that the term blessing appears at least 600 times. That just shows you how important the subject is, isn't it? If a subject is going to be talked about 600 times, it simply means that it is important. And then the issues of curse. Curses appear at least half that time when you look in scriptures. So... So, so now what, what, you need to, what you need to understand is that blessings and curses are vehicles of supernatural power. Curses and blessings are vehicles of supernatural power. And for good, that would be a blessing. And for something bad, that would be a curse. See, and these things, they occur from generation to generation. And if it is a curse... Someone has to, someone at some point has got to break it. Amen. The curse has got to be broken. Like, uh, like you know for a fact that in your family, you know, there are some people who just, you know, who die mysterious death. You know what I mean? you know, like, you know, at, at a particular time of the year, someone has got to die. And someone in the family has to realize this is a curse and it has got to be broken. And it has got to be broken. And, you know, and, and sometimes you realize that they're just illnesses that you just don't understand. Illnesses in the family you just don't understand. And in some of these cases, it will be a curse and it must be broken. Um, and even, even marriages, like broken marriages. For some, it's a curse, isn't it? Like the sister never got married, the auntie never got married. You just know like there's this big line of broken marriages. And in most cases, it is a case. And also, um, childhood, childhood uh, marriages. Like, you know, where, where some, some people have to go out, maybe at the age of 16, you hear the daughter has been married. 16, daughter married. You're supposed to be in school. And you realize that it's not, the, it's not only that daughter, but every daughter in that family. And it's not only the daughters of that family. Even the aunties did the very same things. And it is as a result of a curse. And it must be broken. It must be broken. Why? Simply because Christ was made a curse that we might receive the blessing. You see, if, if like for some people, uh, when you look at it very carefully, you realize that there's mental and emotional breakdown. You know what I mean? Like you just mentally and emotionally broken and for sometimes you don't even know the reason why you were emotionally broken and sometimes it's a curse and it must be broken it must be broken so there are so many problems and 
even poverty sometimes. There's a time in your life where maybe you are broke for a reason. Maybe for you to draw closer to God. Maybe you had too much money. And because of that too much money, you didn't know there was a God. <laughs> But then when you then have to lead a life continually of brokenness, of insufficiency, like for some people, they receive a lot, but it's never enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? They receive a lot, but it's never enough. It's never enough. And it's as a result of a curse. And it must be, it must be broken. So this can only happen when a person, when there's somebody in the family who comes to a recognition and a realization that this is not normal. This is not normal. We can't continue doing things the very same way. You know, we can't relax and think everything is okay. You know, when stuff like that is, is happening. And then, you know, and something to note, something really important when it comes to curses and stuff, is when you read in the book of Proverbs 26 from verse 2, the Bible reads and it says, As the bird uh, by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. If there is no cause, the curse will not come. Like the, like the Shona people would say, Mushonga, haubatire pasina, ronda. And what this implies is that muti is not going to work if there is no cause. So what then does it mean? What then does it tell you as a Christian? That simply means you shouldn't even be afraid of somebody who uses muti. Isn't it? <laughs> Why? Simply because it's not supposed to work on you if you're a Christian. Amen. If you're a Christian, it's not supposed to work on you. So if Muti is working on you, that simply means that there is something you need to correct in your life. Amen. That simply means there is something you need to correct in your life. If somebody is going to use Muti and Muti works, oh, you need to check yourself carefully to see, am I in the right standing with God? Because the Bible tells us that there is no witchcraft against Israel. And you need to look at yourself and realize that you are the Israel of God. You need to look at yourself and realize that you are the Israel of God. And no matter what the enemy tries to do, it won't work on you. But if it's working, that simply means there is something you need to correct. So in other words, don't worry about the guy who's doing the witchcraft. Because this is what's supposed to happen. People are actually supposed to use witchcraft against you. Do you know why? Such that they realize they do not have authority. Amen. And when they realize that they do not have authority, they will come to you and they will ask, what is it about you? Amen. See, I've been trying muti, but muti is not working. What is it about you? Amen. You know what I mean? People should come. You see, witches should be saved because Amen. they tried using muti on you and it failed. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You see, witches in your neighborhood should be saved. I know this is a different type of doctrine, isn't it? Because what we hear out there in the world, the witch must die, isn't it? <laughs> but I'm speaking something different and I'm saying the witch must be saved. <laughs> you see, because God does not rejoice in the death of sinners. And how is the witch going to be saved? Is when you are living right. And they try muti on you and it fails. Amen. And it fails. So according to scripture right there, it only works if there's something wrong with us. When, you see, when you read in Deuteronomy 28, which is a chapter that touches a lot on the issue of curses and blessings, it says in the first verse, it says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the, voice of the, unto the voice of thy Lord, to observe and to do all in his commandments, which I commanded thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations, and above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Just imagine if only you listen to the voice of the living God. If only you listen to the voice of the living God according to scripture. The blessings will overtake you. Amen. Imagine being overtaken by blessings. Would you like to lead a life of being overtaken by blessings? Like you are literally overtaken by blessings. You see, we live in an interesting world. You see, there, are so, there could be so little things that are not so right in your life. And so many big things that are so right that are happening in your life. But you never take time to talk about the 
things that God is doing in your life and you concentrate on the small little things that are not going right. Isn't it? And the sad thing about doing that, the sad thing about doing that is that whatever you focus on becomes bigger. (laughs) Whatever you focus on becomes bigger. So the smaller problem that is in your life becomes bigger. Why? Simply because you concentrated on that small little problem. And guess what? Guess what it will eventually do? Eventually it will overshadow the blessings of God. Before you realize it, you don't see anything good happening around you. Why? Simply because you focused on the small little things. And those small little things, before you realize it, they were magnified. They became so big. They became so big. Why? Simply because you didn't have a heart of thanksgiving. You didn't look at the things that God had done. Like, for instance, when we look in Scripture, we realize that there were ten lepers, isn't it? And Jesus Christ told them, go and show yourself to the priest. And as they were on their way to the priest, they realized that they were healed. And one of them said, oh, I got to go back and give thanks. <laughs> he went back and he gave thanks. And guess what? He was made whole because of being thankful, because of gratitude. The only thing that made him whole was the fact that he was grateful. Which simply means that if he had lost an arm, <laughs> the arm grew back. Because scripture says he was made whole. Why? Simply because of gratitude. It could be that the problems you are in today, the curses that you might be suffering from today, they may have been self-proclaimed. It could be that you focused on the small, you focused, you focused on the minor. <laughs> you focused on the minor. You measured on the minor, which was the curse, which was the problem in your life at that particular time, and then it became big. And today you have no idea where is the blessing of God. You look around, you can't see the blessing of God. Why? Simply because you focused on the smaller things. You focused on the smaller things. So you need to come to that place where you realize that you're not supposed to focus on the minor. You need to focus on God. Focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Praise God, amen. Amen. Praise God, amen. amen. So words can be used to either give you a good life or mess up your life. It is, you see, the Bible tells us that the tongue is the smallest member of the body. But yet, it is, the, it is the most evil if it is not controlled by the Holy Spirit. If it is not under the control of the Holy Spirit, it is the worst thing. Because it will ruin and destroy your life. So, stop talking negative things. Stop focusing on negative things. And see, many times, you know, pe- people ask... Pastor Stan, how are you doing? I say, I am doing, I am blessed. I'm doing pretty well. It doesn't mean that I have $10,000 in my pocket. I probably don't even have a dollar. <laughs> but I am blessed and I am doing well. Because my circumstances do not determine how I am feeling. Amen. You see, my circumstances at that particular time, they do not determine how I am feeling. I may be stuck with no transport money, but that's not going to determine how I am feeling. Amen. Amen. That's not going to determine how I'm feeling. And the thing is, I continually feel that which scripture says, I am blessed and highly favored. Amen. Amen. I am blessed and highly favored. I move in the blessing. I move in the blessing. And, and obviously, one of, the, one of the reasons why it is pretty much easy to move in the blessing is because of that scripture that I read right there. You need to hearken to the voice of God. You see, like uh, five years ago, when I was in prayer, I was praying five years ago, and I was praying an ambitious prayer. I was praying for Australia, Canada, America. You know, I wanted to go outside the country, you know. And as I was praying in the middle of prayer, God stopped me. And God was like, Stan, you don't even have a home church. (laughs) You want to go to Australia, Canada, America? What do you want to do there? You don't even have a home church on your own country and i had an excuse i was like god i live in mufakose god you know you know where i live i live in mufakose and you understand the kind of person that i am before i realize i easily forget that i easily forget the language in which i am communicating (laughs) and before i realize that i am speaking in english god (laughs) and and i've lost the audience already without me even knowing (laughs) and then god was like You know what, son? In your very own country, in that country, there's a community to which I have sent you to. You see, in that country, there's a community that I have sent you to. 
during that time, I didn't know. I, I, didn't, I didn't even know there was this community. I, I had no idea <laughs> this community existed. Uh, but I knew one man. His name was Andy Green. You guys know Andy Green? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Late Andy Green. I knew Andy Green. So during that particular time, Andy Green had always invited me to this community. He says, Pastor Stan, Acadia is waiting for you. But for me, it was like, you know, Acadia is waiting for me. <laughs> you know, I mean, I just, I mean, I was thinking Australia, Canada, America, and you're telling me <laughs> Acadia is waiting for me. <laughs> but then as, as, I was in, as, I, as, as I was in prayer, having a conversation with God, immediately, immediately, the name of Andy Green came into my head. And then I remembered, oh, Andy Green had always said, Acadia is waiting for you. And it was in that very same week I decided to be obedient to the voice of God and come to the community. And to the shock of my life, to the shock of my life, there really was a community that was waiting for me. Amen. I was shocked. I was shocked. You know, imagine coming to a place where you did not grow up and folks in it already know you already. <laughs> And obviously, you, I mean, they didn't see any pictures of you, but they know you. <laughs> I'm like, oh, so you are Pastor Stan. Then I really wonder, what would Andy Green <laughs> say to the people? <laughs> then you know definitely that can only be but the Spirit of God. And the only thing that we have to do is we just have to be obedient. We just have to be obedient. So that's, that's like being obedient in the place of calling, isn't it? Which is probably maybe the biggest thing. Someone is struggling with a very small thing. You know, like, <laughs> you know, someone, someone, you know, there's something that God told you to stop doing a long time ago and you, you're still doing it. <laughs> and it's probably a very small thing. But the danger is that disobeying the laws of God, what it will actually do is that it brings in a necessary kind of curse on your life. Oh, yeah. Like, for instance, uh, you know, as, as Sister Alice, Allison was, was ministering, I mean, she, was, she gave us a brief testimony of her life and, where, and how deep she had gone and how lost she was, where she was at a point of begging. I mean, look at her. Do you think she is somebody who should be begging? You know, if you're to find someone like her begging, I mean, you know, you like wonder what's going on. Oh, what's going on? That can only be but a curse from the devil, isn't it? If you find a person like her begging, you know that's a curse from the devil. But nevertheless, because someone was obedient and ministered to her, and she came to a place of obedience in her, whole, you know, her own personal life, and today she has the grace and the ability to stand before us and minister to us. Amen. Today she can stand and speak the word of the living God. Today she can stand and quote scriptures, simply because somebody was obedient to minister to her. Yes. And, and also she, just, she, she was quite obedient anyway, you know, when I say... Um, uh, Sister Allison, would you like, would you please go and take a teaching on Sunday? I would like you to, to do the teaching. I didn't know what she was going to say, but I knew God was going to help her. <laughs> and she was, she just took a step of obedience. And by so doing, I tell you for a fact, by just standing here and by just ministering, certain things are being broken, even in her own personal life. Amen. Certain things are being broken, even in her, in her own personal life, simply because of? Obedience, similar because of obedience. See, God will begin to use us and use us mightily. I, 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 noticed, I, I noticed afterwards, you know, when she was done, she was done and she was sitting down, um, her close friends or relatives, you never know, <laughs> started saying, oh, we have a new pastor, we have a new pastor. You know what I mean? Because, you know, something... <laughs> Because something would definitely be happening in the life of an individual. Amen. Something would definitely be. I mean, we never would have known what she cares when she's just sitting in our own house. You know what I mean? <laughs> we would never know what she cares. And which is the very same thing with each and every one of us in this place. They are dynamites on the inside of you. You carry so much greatness and so much potential. But if you are just seated in the comfort of your house, you never know what you carry. And you may never get to experience the blessing of God. You may never get to experience the blessing of God, simply because you may not be aware of that which you, that which you carry. So that's why you realize there's this one thing that I, I, do, I do a lot, and I love challenging people to do something that they may not be comfortable with doing. The whole idea I would challenge someone is says that, you see, 
when you are challenged and you do something, you may actually get to discover something about yourself that you didn't know previously. Amen. Uh, like, I'm, I'm involved with training school kids. There's what is known as Adventure Unlimited. And, and we, we simply tell school kids that the adventure is not limited. Try out every good thing, not, not bad things. Try out every good thing. And in trying out all these good things, you get to discover something about your self. Like, for instance, when, when you read scripture, when you read, when you read the Bible, the word of God, the Bible says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, first to the Jews and to the Greek also, for therein is the righteousness of God is revealed. If you notice and look at it very carefully, the righteousness of God is revealed when you're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So if you don't take an adventure to share the gospel of Christ, you will never get to know the righteousness of God. And yet Jesus Christ tells us and he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. How am I going to find the righteousness of God? The righteousness of God is wrapped up in me going out to tell someone about Jesus. The righteousness of God is wrapped up as I open up my home and I say, I'm doing a Bible study meeting. Amen. That's where I get to discover the righteousness of God. In other words, I get to see God from a different dimension and a different understanding. Why? Simply because I've taken a step of faith. And as I take that step of faith, I get to discover who I am in God and what are the things that God has created me to do. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. See, when I, when I, when I look at life and I look at it very carefully, I think a blessing is being able to serve God. I know many times blessings can be limited to material possessions. Isn't it? That's limiting the blessing. <laughs> Lim because, trust me, a person who doesn't even serve God can drive a big car and live in a big house. <laughs> a person who doesn't even serve God can look pretty well, better than a person who is serving God. So we can't say that the, because this person has material blessings, material possessions, therefore this person is blessed. But a person who has the capacity and the ability to serve God is the most blessed person. It's the most blessed person. So in other words, you need, so if you look at yourself, if you are unable, if you are unable to serve God, you need to realize that's a curse. That's a curse. Failure to serve God, that's a curse. Why? Simply because, you know, earlier, earlier when, we started, when we started this meeting, I stated that demon spirits and evil spirits and curses are included. What they simply do is they come to... First of all, to torture and to mentor a person. That's what evil spirits simply come to do. No wonder, no, like for instance, when we speak about uh, emotional and mental breakdown, that's being tormented, you know what I mean? That's being tortured by an evil spirit. And that's what evil spirits come to, to do. And then the second thing they come to do is they come to ensure that you never get to have a relationship with Jesus. You never get to re have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. And then the third thing, guess what they will do? If you actually have a relationship with God and you know this Christ, they will stop you from serving him effectively. So the moment you are stopped from serving God effectively, automatically you need to know that that is nothing but a curse. Failure to serve God. Do you know this Jesus? But you don't serve him. Like for instance, you don't have a home church in your own house. That's a curse. Failure to have a home church at your house is a curse. And it's a curse that you must break like ma ma many a times you know having a home church at your house is not necessarily inviting people from the neighborhood but just you and your family on a daily basis to say that before after dinner after which we have dinner together as a family <laughs> and then after dinner we are going to be reading scriptures together and after reading scriptures we are going to pray together Already what you have just done right there is that you have brought church into your very own house. And then if there is yet another day where you can decide and you can say, okay, on this particular day, I'm, inv I'm inviting at least 15 families from my neighborhood. Then that will be beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. That will be beautiful. But failure to have home church at your own house, that's a curse. And it's a curse that you must break. Amen. It's a curse that you must break. 
You see, you wonder why your children are, are what they are today? It's simply because there was a discipling that was supposed to happen in the house that never happened. There was a discipling that was supposed to happen in the house that never happened. And now we have, a, we, we, we have kids that do not amount to anything, do not do anything significant. Why? Simply because us as parents, we failed at some point. We, we didn't do what we were supposed to do. And we were supposed to create an environment that allows our children to grow in the fear of God. Amen. It was us. You see, the problems that we are facing today, it's not because of anything else. It's because of us. Amen. And what then does it mean? That simply means that if we want to change this, if we want to change, if we want to break the curse, then we need to start a new culture and it needs to start today. Amen. We need to start a new culture and a new culture has to start today. You see, you may not, you see, you may not necessarily know, like, okay, if I'm, to, if I'm to have a Bible study meeting, what will I teach? That's why, you have, that's why there's a man of God. You ask <laughs> and you're given not. You don't, you, don't, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Amen? Amen? You don't need to reinvent the wheel. So it is my passion and my heart desire. Like when, when the Lord told me to come to this community, you see, I, 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 I definitely didn't have money to hire, to hire a venue <laughs> or anything. But was I going to sit back, relax and say, God, I don't have money to hire a venue? No. I made sure that I go into people's homes. And to my own surprise, People's homes were opened. Amen. People just opened their homes. People just opened their homes. And ministry began. Hallelujah. And ministry began. So let us find ourselves in that place where we are obedient to the voice of God and do the things that God has called us to do. Because that is the only way we're going to experience the blessing of God. That is the only way we're going to experience the blessing of God. Praise God. Amen. Okay. Since our meeting is supposed to finish at 11, time seems to be flying. I have no idea. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about four steps which one has to take in order to break the curse. Four steps a person has to take in order to break the curse. The curse has got to be broken and there are four steps that leads to that. Number one, in order for a person to break the curse, they have got to recognize that there is a curse. You can't break a curse that you, you, you don't know is there, isn't it? It's only when you recognize there is a curse, that is the only time that you find yourself needing to break it. You need to recognize it. And the other thing that I didn't say earlier is that curses... Uh, they, okay, the vehicle for curses and blessings, I'm, I mentioned one of it, words, and then the other one could be objects. Objects. You know, there could be objects in your house. And the, to, you, to you, they're just objects. You know what I mean? <laughs> but those objects may be hindering the move and the flow of God in your house. Hindering the move and the flow of God in your house. I remember just yesterday I was speaking to this one, I was speaking to this one, well, um, Maybe he's a young man, he's way older than me, he has kids. A young man, he remains young. I was speaking to this young man, and he is, uh, you know, I was talking to him about this subject. And in the middle of talking, he was like, you know what, Pastor Stan? There is a picture in my house. I don't think it glorifies God. And it could be, it could be a source of all of my problems <laughs> without knowing. You know what I mean? Like there are people with paintings in their house. But the thing is, what you have is not just the painting. You have the spirit behind the man who did the painting yeah. in your house. Yeah. Idolatry. Idolatry. And that hinders the flow and the move of God <laughs> in, your, in your house. You wonder, you wonder why you're, you, you're always fighting with your spouse? <laughs> you wonder why you, things never seem to work out, things never seem to add up? It's probably simply because of an object that is in your house. You wonder why you never seem to do well financially. It could be because of an object in your house. You, you know, you need, to, you, need to, you need to sometimes sit down, relax, look through things in your house and understand what is this thing doing here? What is this thing really for? What do I gain from this thing being in my house? Yeah. You know, there's this great man of God. His name is Derek Prince. I'd like to believe Derek, Derek Prince must be late now. Derek Prince gives a testimony in which he was talking about how his, how his grandfather was in the army 
uh, maybe during the First World War. And for some reason, he was, sent, he was sent to China. And when he was in China, he collected paintings of dragons from China. As far as he was concerned, they are just nothing but paintings. And, and then he passed down these, you know, these, uh, these lovely, beautiful things to his grandson. You know, he loved his grandson, and grandson loved granddad, so he passed down. So he collected these things and he placed them in his house because they are from his granddad. You know, granddad gave me these lovely paintings of dragons. Granddad meant no harm. To him, they are just nothing but paintings. So there he was one day as he was in his living room. He looked and he realized they're actually dragons in his house. And then God asked him a question and he said, what are those things? Then he told them they're dragons. Then God asked him, what does the Bible say about dragons? What do dragons signify in the Bible? And then he was like, Satan. <laughs> and then automatically at that particular time, God asked him a question and said, what is Satan doing on the wall in your house? <laughs> what is Satan doing on the wall in your house? And then out of obedience, remember that word, out of obedience, he decided that he would take those things out. He took those paintings out of this house and he disposed of them. He got rid of them. And immediately soon after getting rid of the dragons, guess what happened? His financial life changed. He had no idea <laughs> that it was going to, you know, he was going to be blessed financially by just doing that. As far as he was concerned, he was making enough to go by. <laughs> you know, he was fine, but he wasn't, make, he wasn't, he didn't have access. You, you know, people want access, isn't it? Like, you know, I just want access. I just want some more money. <laughs> he didn't have access. But at this particular time, he suddenly had access. Why? Simply because he decided to get rid of objects in his house that were hindering the flow of God. He decided to get rid of objects that were hindering the flow of God. And he says that when these, painting, when these paintings were in his house, he would constantly have fights with his wife. He didn't understand why is it so there isn't, you know, proper communicating in my, in my house. How come, you know, there isn't that romance and sweetness in my house? After getting rid of the dragons, the sweet presence and the sweet fellowship amongst husband and wife began. Why? Similar because... They got rid of objects that were hindering the flow of God in their lives. Sometimes you may be carrying a curse. Why? Simply because of objects in your house. So sometimes you need to sit back, relax, and go through your things and figure out really what is this thing and what value is it adding to my life? What value is it adding to my life? So it all goes back to recognizing. You have got to recognize in order to break the curse. And then the other thing is you need to repent. Once you have recognized, secondly, you have got to repent. In other words, you make sure that you keep away from anything that causes you to, to sin. Keep away. Keep away. Just like with, with that lovely, wonderful teaching. You need to keep away. Like, for instance, if, she, if when she craved for another cigarette and when she craved for another bottle of beer, if she had gone for it again, she would have been out begging. She would have been out begging should have been out begging you know uh I, I okay let me not get there because i was going to talk about something it's not good to talk about people in their in their absence so it's good to talk about them when they're there <laughs> anyway so i was going to i was going to say something but it would be wonderful to say it when they're there praise god amen um then the third thing you have to do is you need to renounce you need to renounce sinful influences over your life. You need to renounce. One of the most important things is you have got to renounce. Like you have recognized, you have repented, and you have got to renounce. And destroying ornaments, destroying those things that seem to be very precious and important in your house is a way of renouncing. Um, is, is, a, is a way of renouncing. So what you what you'll be doing is you're renouncing, you're renouncing all contact with all cults and getting rid of every all cult object. You have to get rid of every all cult object. In other words, you see, people find themselves worshiping things which by nature are no gods, but they're worshiping them. 
And sometimes people, people worship these things without even knowing they are worshiping them. They worship these things and they worship, worship them out of ignorance. I remember this one time I was having, I was having a conversation with Allison and Allison said, uh, the cigarette, you know, marijuana had become a god. You know, like she couldn't live without it because it had become a god. And alcohol to her had become a god. She couldn't live without it. Why? Because it had become a god. Like if there's anything that you can't live without, that thing is your God. That thing is your God. If you can't live without it, that thing is your God. You see, I know people say, you know, you know, I worship the Lord God in heaven. I love the Lord God in heaven. No, check the thing that you can't live without. That thing is your God. Like I, I can't live without Jehovah God. I can't leave, I can't go for a second without telling someone about Jesus. I can't. It's impossible. Why? Because I love him. Guess what? If you love someone, guess what you do? You talk about them. If you love someone, you talk about them. I remember this one time I was in a love relationship and I loved this young girl. And I would tell everybody about her. I would tell everybody about her. Because I what? I loved her. And definitely stop talking about her when she stopped talking about me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but if you love someone, you talk about them. Just like footballers love football. They just can't do without talking about football. <laughs> you know, it's like they have an excuse to have a conversation. <laughs> and football is what they will talk about. Why? Because they love it. You know, strangers in a bus, they will ask you about the game. I don't know anything about the game, my brother. You know, they want to know what's happening. I don't know anything about the game. You know, they love it that they just want to talk about it. Amen. And in the very same manner, if you love Jesus, guess what you do? You just want to talk about him. Just want to talk about him. You see, it may not, it may not be that something big has happened. But that small little thing that has happened, you just want to talk about it. Like it had not been for Jesus. Like there's this one time, there's this one time I was just, share, I was just sharing a conversation and I was saying, you know, um, oh, I have three minutes. I was just sharing a conversation and I was saying, you know what, today, like there's a day when I got a free ride. I mean, I get free rides quite, quite a number of times, but there's a time when I got a free ride from, from, my, from my home into town and it happened in a very special way. You know, when something happens in a special way, you talk about it. <laughs> Isn't it? Like, Jesus did it for me. He gave me a free ride when I wasn't expecting it. You know, where I was thinking, like, this, this is what actually happened. I can just, I, uh, to, sorry for taking too much time, but I can just repeat this. For some that may have heard it already. Like, there's a time when it was like a Sunday morning, because what I'd been doing is that I'd been ministering in Glendale out on a farm every Sunday. So this one Sunday morning, I decided that I, I needed some cheap transport. You know, I mean, there's a Zupko going for 50 cents. Why pay more when there's a Zupko going for 50 cents? So I decided that I would wait for a Zupko that day. And on that particular day, guess what happened? The Zupko took too long to come. So I then decided, oh, let me jump into the next combi that comes, because I'm running behind time. As I jumped into this combi, guess what happens? Immediately, the Zupko bus comes. Oh. So as the Zupko bus was passing, I say to myself on the inside of me, if only I had waited a little bit longer. And as I was saying that to myself, guess what happens? The conductor, the conductor says, you are not paying today. Wow. You are not, where on earth does a conductor who wants three dollars says you are not paying today? <laughs> then I know for a fact that it can only be but Jesus. It's God who didn't want me to pay in the first place. He didn't even want me to pay the 50 cents. <laughs> he didn't want me to pay even the 50 cents. Mm. And this was obviously because of one thing, obedience. Because I was what? I was going out to do the work of the living God. And then the, the fourth thing is that you have got to resist. You have got to resist. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That is, uh, you need to resist the devil and he will flee. When you read in James 4, verse 7 
and 8. The Bible reads and it says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near unto God, and he will draw near unto you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Amen. Amen. So the thing is, you've got to resist the devil, and when you do, he will flee from you. So that's, that, that probably means if the devil is sticking around, you're probably not resisting him. You're probably not resisting him. And the devil will probably stick around in different forms. Maybe he's sticking around in form of a bottle. <laughs> and you're not resisting that bottle. You're not resisting it. That's why he's still there. That's why he's still there. And scripture says resist the devil and he will flee from you. And maybe he's sticking around in form of anger. You just get angry. And when you get angry, you are uncontrollable. But guess what the Bible says? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil. Mm. Mm. So make sure, see, getting angry could be a natural thing. Somebody's going to step on you. It's a natural phenomenon. It's going to happen. But guess what? As they step on you, you choose your reaction. See, nobody makes you angry and nobody makes you mad. You decide. You decide after which you have stepped on whether you're going to be angry or you're going to be mad. You decide. And guess what? Your decisions then determines at the end of it all what's going to come out of it. So, so I, I, think, I think we have mentioned the, the four things, the four principles that one has to do. And there are seven steps, which, um, which definitely I, I do not have the time to go through today. Uh, by the grace